you know, words are a very interesting thing and a very powerful thing. As we enter into the word this morning, I was reminded that uh, Paul uses a word to describe the power that's contained in Scripture. He uses this word dunamis. And dunamis is a Greek word, and it's the root word for dynamite. So there's this power in the word, but sometimes we don't always understand what words mean because we're not familiar with the language they were written in. I actually saw a little uh, article talking about how some products that were very successful in the U.S. here had difficulty transferring into other countries because the word didn't translate well into another culture. And an example of that would be, there was a car that, I don't know if they make it anymore, but Chevrolet made a car called the Nova. And, and I had a Nova, they were good cars, and they sold very well in the U.S. They didn't sell well in Spanish-speaking countries, because Nova, Maria, means what? Won't go. <laughs> well, it's hard to convince people to buy one, see? And other words have, have had trouble transferring into different cultures. Microsoft came up with a cool search engine name, right? It's called Bing. We're like, Bing, I could go to Bing. But in China, when they tried to translate Bing, it came out meaning sick pancake. <laughs> Nobody wanted to use it. And even worse was the poor Coca-Cola company. They tried to translate that phrase Coca-Cola into uh, Chinese, and it, 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 the advertisement said, bite the wax tadpole. <laughs> Nobody was buying it. So you would think like Pepsi's gonna just come in and sweep through China, right? Because nobody wants to buy Coke. The problem Pepsi had was they had this slogan, come alive with the Pepsi generation. And translated to Chinese, it said, Pepsi brings your dead ancestors back to life. <laughs> and poor Gerber, you know, the baby food company, they got the cute little baby on the jar. It wasn't selling well in France because they didn't realize that Gerber in French meant vomit. <laughs> Which actually fit very well with the baby, you know what I mean? And then there was Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC. We had this great, you know, visual thing. Finger licking good, right? Get that last drop off of there. But then in Chinese, they translated it as, you'll bite your fingers off. <laughs> so here's the thing. God is desiring to restore. It's the very first part of what we see in our vision of what He wants to do in our lives. He wants to restore. But God not only wants to restore us to a proper relationship with Him. That's primary. He also wants to restore us to a proper relationship with each other. And that means breaking down these barriers of communication. Breaking down these artificial barriers that separate us from one another. And to bring us into one. And that's what we're going to see the Apostle Paul address here in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Paul continues from what we read last week saying, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Okay, so you have to understand this, that this church that Paul established in Ephesus was made up primarily, if not exclusively, people who were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. The church that Jesus established was first established among Jewish people in Jerusalem and Judea, but then it was to spread out to Samaria and the ends of the earth. And Paul was one of the people called to take it to the Gentiles. And last week you might remember that Paul told these Gentiles that they at one time were dead 
in their trespasses and sins. But that part of it, being dead in trespasses and sins, was actually true whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What Paul's doing now is he's telling these Gentiles that you had an additional problem. Beyond the fact that you were born dead in your trespasses, you didn't have a covenant with God. Whereas the Jewish people, the people of Israel, had a covenant with God. And that covenant allowed them a means of temporary forgiveness of sins. They had a way of going before God and getting cleansed, although it wasn't permanent. It, it was just temporary. The Gentiles didn't have that. And Paul's saying, listen, it's not just that you were dead. It's that you had no way of doing anything about that. You had no covenant with God. You had no relationship with God. And you had no hope of ever having a relationship with God. The only hope a Gentile ever had in the Old Covenant was to become what they called a proselyte, which means uh, somebody who's converting, and then they would convert to Judaism, then they could enter into that covenant. But a pure Gentile, no hope, no God, no covenant. Now, last week when Paul was sharing the bad news that you were dead, he, he said everything changed because of these two words. But God. But God, in his great love, did something about it. And now, Paul's going to do a similar thing for these Gentiles when he says, you formerly didn't have a covenant with God. Now he has two words for them. But now. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile both of them into one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So Paul is describing here for them that there was this horrible separation at one time between people who were Jewish and people who were non-Jewish. And he says that God's doing away with that. And he uses two significant examples of what that looks like. The first thing is he says that Jesus broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now this is not just a metaphorical dividing wall. It is a literal, physical dividing wall that existed in the temple in Jerusalem. There was a wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Israelites. And there were actually signs posted on the outside of that wall warning Gentiles, don't even think about going in there. In fact, the archaeologists recently found a, a, an inscription carved on a piece of what used to be the wall there at Herod's temple. And this is what it said. Obviously in Hebrew. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. It was a serious wall. And because if you were a Gentile, you couldn't go beyond that wall, you know what happened beyond that wall? Sacrifices for sin. You're not able to go in there, therefore you can't sacrifice for sin, therefore you can't get forgiveness. You're excluded from the covenant. But Jesus broke that wall down. And he gave everybody, Jew or Gentile, equal access to mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And so the second thing that Paul says, in addition to Jesus breaking down that dividing wall, he says he is, he is abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, 
I love the New American Standard Bible. That's what I almost always teach from because it's very accurate to what Paul wrote. He wrote in Greek. It's translated directly from the Greek. But let me tell you something. That's a mouthful. Abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So I'm going to read you that same phrase. This is a new century version. It's a little, puts it a little more simply. The Jewish law had many commands and rules, but Christ ended them. That's what Paul's saying here. The old covenant law was a system designed to give temporary forgiveness to the Jewish people only. People of Israel had access to a covenant that could give them temporary forgiveness. And the only reason the system existed was to teach them their need for forgiveness and to want them to long for a permanent forgiveness that could only come through the Messiah. This old covenant was a series of commandments and rules, or as it says in the New York Standard, commandments contained in ordinances. A bunch of rules, hundreds of them. And they were set to make one clear point, and that was this, you can't keep them. You can't keep them no matter how hard you try. Or you can keep some of them, on a good day. But as the book of James tells us, if anyone puts themselves under the law and says, I'll get my righteousness through the law, well, that's good, except if you break one part of it, you're guilty of the whole thing. So don't keep count of how many parts you're doing good on, because if you're breaking one part of it, you're toast. So the whole purpose was to cause the people of Israel to look to God and say, we're trying, but we're failing. <laughs> We're waiting for the Messiah because this isn't working. We need a new covenant. And the prophets promised that, that God would take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. And the law wouldn't be written on tablets anymore. It would be written in our hearts. And so Paul says here, but now in Christ Jesus, these laws of the Old Testament, which were given only to the Jews, and therefore caused a separation between Jews and Gentiles, it doesn't matter because they've already been fulfilled by Jesus. They don't apply to any of us anymore. Our righteousness is by faith, not by the law. And this was exciting news to the Gentiles because prior to, see, the Jews had the opportunity for two covenants, an old covenant and then enter into a new covenant through their faith in Christ. The Gentiles didn't have an old covenant. When Jesus came along, he was the only game in town. And that's all they needed. And Paul says this, the news to Gentiles is this, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And in verse 17 he says, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. That verse 17 is actually a quote from Isaiah. Isaiah said this prophetically in Isaiah 57, verses 18 and 19. He's talking about man. He's talking about people. And, and he says his. He says, I have seen his ways, man's ways, but I will heal him. And I will lead him and restore comfort to him and to his mourners, creating the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord. And I will heal him. I love the fact that it says, I will restore. That's what God's desired to do. And when it says here that God was going to restore those who were near, he's talking about the Jews. The Jews were nearer to God than the Gentiles. That's the simple fact of the matter. They were his chosen people. He said, you're near to me. Everybody else is far off. I chose these people. I made a covenant with them. That brought them near to him. People without the covenant were far off. So God said, I'm going to take those people who are near to me and bring them to a peace through my son. And I'm going to take all of you who are far away and I'm going to bring you in and make you near to me too. Paul sums up the difference that this faith has now made in the lives of the Ephesians by saying this in verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. 
What a difference he's describing here. He says, you used to be a stranger, now you're a citizen. You used to be an alien, now you're a saint. And then he goes on in verses 20 and through 22 to describe what does this look like to be part of God's household. He says this, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Keep this in mind. Everything in the Old Covenant focused on the temple. The Jewish people only had a covenant because they had a temple. That was where you had to go. You want to keep the covenant? You go to the temple, offer your sacrifices, and you can get clean for a period of time. Well, that temple was going to be destroyed in the year AD 70. Gone. But you know what? Paul's saying this. It really doesn't matter. That's not the temple anymore. You're the temple. And God is building in us on what Paul says, the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. And the chief cornerstone of the new temple is Jesus himself. Paul says the same thing if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, remember, he's a, an apostle, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so Paul back here in Ephesians was telling us in verses 21 and 22 that the whole building is being fitted together and it's growing into a holy temple to the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And once again, you can read a similar thing as Peter describes it in 1 Peter 2.5. He says, you also, you as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In the old temple, they offered animal sacrifices. God doesn't want that. His son was the perfect sacrifice. The only sacrifice we need to offer now in this temple, spiritual sacrifices. That's what we're called to do. But here's the important thing to understand in this. There's a temple in me, and there's a temple in you where the Holy Spirit resides. But if we see ourselves as individual buildings, we'll miss the point of what God's doing. Because he's taking my stone, my temple, and he's placing it next to yours. And he's placing somebody else's on top and somebody else's on top. And he is building his kingdom through the unity of our lives working together. That's the crucial element of what Paul's trying to bring forth here. And in order to understand how earth-shattering and mind-blowing this message would have been to the Ephesians, you have to understand it. Paul's saying this to them. You and the Jews, you're like this. Sounds like no big deal, right? It was a big deal. Because I'll tell you what, in the culture of that day, the Jews and the Gentiles saw a wide gap between them as people. For instance, in those days, there was a, a, a little term that the Jewish person would use to describe Gentile. A dog. Dogs. And you say, well, that's horrible. No, it was just the way they did it. And, and listen, Jesus did it too. Jesus was Jewish. And a Syrophoenician woman who was a Gentile came to him and said, my daughter is sick. I know you can heal. And Jesus said, I was sent to the children of Israel. That was my primary call as the children of Israel. It's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. But she had faith and she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs off the table. And Jesus said, your faith is great. You'll have what you ask for. But you see, there was, that, was the, that was a measure of the relationship. She was outside. She was far off. Jesus said, I'm coming to minister first to those who are near to God. You're outside. And that was a glimpse. And there are several other glimpses where Jesus was showing this is eventually for everybody. But in the Jewish culture, there was a common understanding that God created the Gentiles for a purpose. They were to be used as fuel for hell. And 
if a Jewish person returned home from a Gentile territory, had walked through a Gentile territory, as soon as they got back into Jewish territory, what'd they do? Brush all that dust off their feet. I don't want any Gentile dust on me. It's, it's unclean. I don't want it touching me. And if a Jewish boy or a Jewish girl shocked everybody and married a Gentile, the Jewish family would have a funeral. As far as they're concerned, that child was dead. And, 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 and let's not be out of balance here. Those are things uh, that uh, describe how the Jewish people saw the Gentiles. It was certainly not much better uh, in the reverse. The Gentiles had a very strong history and it continues to this day of persecuting the Jews. And in the days of King Xerxes, they passed an ordinance that was going to exterminate all the Jewish race, except for Esther stepped up and saved them. But they would have killed everyone. On another occasion, Jews were forbidden to read any of the Old Testament scriptures. If they were caught reading it, they would be put to death. At one time, one of the Roman emperors just banished every Jew, every Jew, from, from Rome. Get them out of here. I don't want to look at them. But Christ comes and he says, no, no, no. I want you together. I'm calling you into unity. I'm making you both parts of God's household. And here's what we need to understand. It goes beyond just Jews and Gentiles. That's what Paul's referring to here in Ephesians, but it's more than that. And he expands on it in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 to 29. He says this, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So here in Ephesians, he's talking about uh, the Jews and Gentiles being brought back together. In Galatians, he's saying it's not just Jews and Gentiles, it's, it's also uh, uh, males and females, it's, it's everybody being brought together. And I think if we extend that simply to the truer understanding, we're saying this, that in God's eyes, he doesn't see Jews and Gentiles anymore. He doesn't see men and women. He doesn't see blacks or whites, Asians or Hispanics. He sees people clothed in Christ. End of discussion. That's it. We're clothed, we're not clothed. And see, we have to grasp that is part of the full meaning of what we say when people, when we say we are people restored. We're not just restored to God, we're restored to each other. We have to be able to walk in unity to fulfill God's plan. And, and if we understand how this came about in the first place, then we can get a sense of why God had to undo all that. Because the, the artificial separation of people into distinct groups to say, I'm different from you, started in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. Because it, in verse 1 it says this, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Mm, did not translate anything. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the Son of Man had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. This is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come. Let us go down and confuse their language, so they will not understand one another's words. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. You see, there was a sinfulness in the hearts of the people. Notice when they build this tower, it's not for God's glory. It's for their glory. 
It's not for God's name to be lifted up. It's for their name to be lifted up. And God would not be robbed of his glory. He says, you know what? I gave you a gift. I gave you a gift of unity. I gave you a gift of a common language. You don't want to use it to glorify me? Fine. Let's see how you make it up without it. And from that moment, people couldn't understand each other. People couldn't relate to each other. And people started to see each other as different. And when people started to see each other as different, they said, I'm not the same as you. That means one of us must be better than the other. And I think it's me. So I don't like you. And I'm going to look down on you. And he created hostility. He created war. He created prejudice. That was a result of the people's sinful hearts not wanting to give God the glory. But you see, from the beginning, God had a desire to reverse that, to turn it back around and make people one again. And we see in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, God turning it back around. It says here, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, we're not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongue, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this let me tell you something, they couldn't figure that out, but we know because of what we're reading in Ephesians chapter 2. What does it mean? It means that God is pulling people back together. He's breaking down dividing walls. He's breaking down artificial differences that never really existed except in our own minds. And he's saying, look, it doesn't matter what your cultural heritage is. There's some awesome cultural heritages out there, but those should not be a basis for separation any longer. Nothing should separate us from one another. Even as Laurie talked about this morning, God says nothing can separate us from his love, and in his perfect will, nothing can separate us from each other's love either. That's the goal, that for people from every tongue, tribe, and nation would worship him and worship him together. Because as we do that, we're building the wonderful temple from the living stones that he has put in our hearts. And this is a song about the unity that God has desired to give us. You want to mute that? It's unmuted. It is? Well, you know what? It's not like unmuted, it's unplugged. So why don't you uh, uh, mute it again so I don't make a big loud noise here. Now, go ahead and unmute it. That's better. <laughs>